<laughs> Namaste, everyone. We bring to you another interesting webinar of the series, Safeguarding Nature in Tiger Range Countries, where our focus TRC is Thailand. This webinar was initiated due to generous funding of USAID for Asia's linear infrastructure, Safeguarding Nature, more popularly called the Align Project. The project aims to expand the adoption and implementation of high quality safeguards to protect biodiversity and livelihoods in response to Asia's rapid expansion of linear infrastructure, especially road, railways, and power lines. Align is implemented by World Wildlife Fund in partnership with Center for Large Landscape Conservation in three focal countries, WWF India, Nepal, Mongolia. To know more about the project, kindly click the link shared in the chat box. Tigers are considered umbrella species and help to protect and conserve a large intact forest. However, the conservation landscape often overlaps with developmental activities to meet the growing demand of the growing world. To understand these challenges and opportunities to document the initiatives being done across tiger range countries to safeguard nature, WWF India and Global Tiger Forum designed this webinar series where representatives of TRCs and funding partnership organization like World Bank, ADB and IUCN can use a line platform for knowledge sharing. The previous recording of the webinar in the series can be accessed via the link shared in the chat box. We would like to share the agenda. We have three speakers today presenting for approximately 15 minutes each. We would like to wrap up the webinar in one and a half hours. The questions and answers session will be in the end and the recording would be uploaded on WWF India YouTube channel. With this background, we start the webinar and would like to invite our senior Dr. Sejal Vora for introductory remark. Dr. Sejal Vora has worked in the field of environmental conservation and sustainable development for over 30 years. She is currently program director at WWF India in New Delhi. Over the course of her career, Sejal has worked in over 20 countries in South and Southeast Asia, the Pacific and East Africa. Now I would request Dr. Vora for the remark. Thank you. Um, can you remove my mugshot from the screen so that I can actually see my face? Thank you. Um, so thank you very much to uh, the team at Align and GTF for inviting me to uh, speak at this uh, at this webinar. Um, you know, one of the things I want to just start off by saying is uh, the importance of this series. And I'm so delighted uh, that this discussion and this forum for exchange is happening uh, on this very, very important topic. I understand this is the third uh, of a series of uh, six webinars that will happen. Uh, and I expect that at the end of this, we will have a comprehensive uh, uh, set of, you know, information and knowledge on this particular issue, which... Uh, can form the basis of future discussions. So, uh, so thank you for organizing this and thank you for inviting me. Just to set the context a little bit, uh, many of you uh, certainly on this panel and uh, many of the listeners and participants will also remember that way back in 2010, the world came together to set an ambitious goal for tiger, tiger conservation. Um, and at that time, we know that tigers were in trouble uh, we know that it was important to change the trajectory of tiger conservation. Uh, and we knew that in a way, you know, the world had a chance. We actually had one chance to change and to bend the curve on tiger conservation by setting this ambitious goal and by working together towards it. At that time, uh, I have to say, you know, being part of the process in those days, uh, it seemed like a distant dream. It seemed, uh, you know, something that was over ambitious. Uh, and many people were telling us at that time that, uh, you know, this idea of doubling tiger numbers, because we had set ourselves a goal of doubling tiger numbers by 2022, um, many people said this is impossible. You know, you're setting yourselves up for failure. And uh, at that time, uh, we thought, no, you know, we should set an ambitious goal. Uh, we should set a target and we should try and mobilize uh, globally around this goal. And actually, you know, if you look back, uh, 2022 has come and gone. Uh, we've done an assessment and an estimation, and we came pretty close. 
uh, we came pretty close to doubling tiger numbers. And that in itself is remarkable. It's remarkable because in this day and age, if you look at a lot of species, uh, and in fact, if you look at WWF's own Living Planet Index, uh, which we publish on a regular basis to look at the status of wild species across the world, we are almost without fail reporting declines. We are almost without fail reporting that key species, wild species are in decline all across the world. And in such a scenario where there's a decline in wild species, it is actually a remarkable achievement that for tigers, we have actually turned it around, that we are seeing an increase in tiger numbers. This is one species where we seem to see that the tide is turning and it gives us hope. It shows us that when you do things in a certain way, it is possible. It is possible to reverse the trend of species and the tiger conservation scenario has shown us the way. Uh, why did it work and what, what helped to, to do this for tigers? And I just, I won't go into a long thesis on this, but just, you know, I think two or three things that actually worked for tigers. And maybe we can replicate this for other species as well, because this was unique. In many ways, you know, countries coming together, the range countries all coming together around a single species requires political will. And it requires the governments of these countries to make a commitment. And this is what happened with tigers. We actually saw range countries in South Asia, Southeast Asia, Russia, China coming together over the conservation of a single species. To my mind, this was rare. And this was one of the first times that we were seeing this level of political will of countries coming together. The second thing that we saw, and again, something that I have rarely seen in my long career in conservation, uh, is that civil society came together. NGOs came together. You must have heard of the Tiger Coalition. This is a group of large NGOs, international NGOs working on tiger conservation, actually coming together for a species. Again, this is quite unusual. Uh, and this is quite rare. But for tigers, we did come together. And I think this made a big difference. So we have governments coming together. We have large NGOs coming together. We have, uh, you know, an organization like GTF. Again, this is unique. Not many species have the luxury of having an organization that is actually bringing range countries together around the conservation of a species. So in that sense, we also had an institutional structure that could bring things together around tigers. So this was again, something unique. And finally, I think the fourth thing that worked in, in this case for tigers was the resource mobilization, that we were actually able to mobilize resources. And I'll just give you an example of WWF, uh, my own organization globally, coming together as an organization to raise money for tigers collectively. And as a result of this, we were able to mobilize resources that otherwise would have been piecemeal. You know, we would have had little money for tigers here in this country and that country. Uh, and a lot of this money would be spent. You wouldn't see the impact. But we were able to actually coordinate our fundraising. And we were able to raise money for tigers collectively on a scale that we have not raised money for a single species before. And I think all of these things came together uh, to help turn the tide for tigers. And therefore, uh, to me, this is this is a story which needs to be replicated uh, also for other species. And I hope that we can learn from the tiger success story and look at how we can uh, use this model for other species. And I know uh, that across the world, people are talking about looking at a similar model for, you know, for dolphins, uh, for jaguars, uh, for other big cats, etc. So I think we've set the trend for that. But let's, uh, let's also think long term. Uh, I think, and we know in conservation, and all of us here have worked in conservation for many years, we know that you can never sit back. You can't relax. You can't be complacent. So, uh, you know, we have to think about what does the future hold for tigers? And this is where this particular webinar series and the Align project comes into play because it's looking at the future. And while we may have been successful today, is the, are the challenges of the future going to be the same? And do we need to gear up for those challenges? And so the threats still remain, right? The threats have not gone away for tigers. Poaching still remains a threat. Habitat loss still remains a threat for tigers. Uh, and one of the emerging threats, one of the important emerging threats, certainly in many of the Asian countries and range states of tigers, 
is infrastructure. Uh, you know, all of these countries, including in South Asia and Southeast Asia, we are rapidly developing economies. Uh, in these rapidly developing economies, infrastructure is going to come up. Uh, and linear infrastructure in particular, as we all know, poses a significant threat uh, to tiger conservation. So I think looking at this issue of linear infrastructure and how do we actually come up uh, with smarter solutions for infrastructure is a key element of future tiger conservation. And, and that's why I'm very pleased that this particular initiative is focusing on these two large future challenges of tiger conservation. One is infrastructure and the other is long-term finance. Uh, because while we may have secured the funding for conservation today and maybe for the next five years, uh, what happens in the next 20 years? What happens in the next 30 years? How do countries mobilize and sustain the kind of finances needed uh, for tiger conservation? And indeed, as we know, for tiger conservation also means conservation of forests, of, of landscapes, of other species. How do we secure this kind of landscape level funding in the future? And these are the two issues that uh, are being addressed and, and explored uh, in this webinar series and indeed uh, in, in the Align project. We know that in terms of the finance issue and the sustainable finance issue, uh, there have been a lot of discussions. The recent summit in Bhutan, uh, the Sustainable Finance Summit took this discussion to a completely different level. And again, um, it's, it's very heartening to see that in many ways, tigers are leading the way uh, for the kind of discussion that is happening on the need for sustainable finance uh, and the kind of mobilization of stakeholders that is being done uh, for sustainable finance. So, uh, so I think these are two very timely issues. How do we develop infrastructure in a way that does not actually completely threaten uh, the existence of tigers? How do we develop infrastructure in a way that is, you know, quote unquote, tiger friendly? Uh, and how do we secure the finance that is needed to sustain tiger conservation uh, and conservation of tiger landscapes in the long run? These are two critical issues. And I'm, I'm so glad that this webinar series is exploring these uh, and hopefully coming up with solutions and examples. Uh, today's talk is going to explore both of these issues again, uh, but with a focus on Thailand. And I, I like the way that this series is also looking at countries and focusing on different trade states uh, because each range state has lessons to share. Each range state has different examples, but also things that can be shared across the countries. So it's very important to hear uh, from the different countries about what they're doing, what specific challenges they face, and what solutions uh, are being implemented. And we're going to hear uh, about, about stories from Thailand today. Uh, just as an aside, uh, I'm very pleased to be giving this introduction because Thailand holds a very special place in my heart. Uh, I lived in Bangkok for five years. Uh, I have explored many of the national parks in Thailand. Um, it's, it's an amazing country. People think that Thailand is, uh, you know, mostly tropical forests, but actually it has a huge diversity of landscapes, including montane habitats where tigers are found. You'll be surprised, uh, especially the Indians here, to hear about rhododendron forests in Thailand. Uh, it's it's actually got a huge diversity. The other thing I think that is uh, unique about Thailand and which I really uh, appreciated is the dedication and commitment both of civil society, you know, Thai uh, NGOs working on wildlife conservation, and also the government. Uh, because everywhere you went, you saw you know uh, dedicated staff, you saw well managed parks, uh, and it was a pleasure actually to interact and, and visit many of these areas because there is so much interesting work going on in Thailand, which maybe is not shared enough and not talked about enough. Um, so it's great that we have, uh, you know, Khun Sompot and Khun Sompon here on this talk to tell us about what's going on in Thailand. Uh, in many ways also for tiger conservation, we know that Thailand is a beacon of hope for Southeast Asia. Uh, you have not only secured, but increased your tiger numbers. Uh, and we are very keen to hear uh, both what is going on in the parks um, and, and the research and the management in the parks that is helping to secure tigers in Thailand. And also very interested to hear the case study uh, on linear infrastructure and how uh, Thailand is working uh, to secure and to develop roads in a way that is uh, wildlife friendly. So I think that's going to be a very interesting talk. Also, uh, Kurba is here to tell us about IHTCP, and that's going to cover the finance angle and the collaboration angle, because we know that without collaboration, 
uh, conservation is not going to be sustained. So we are eager to hear also uh, from Purbaji about uh, ITCP and the funding model that, that they follow and how we can encourage actually other funding organizations also uh, to follow similar models. So with that, I'll, uh, I'll end my introduction. Uh, looking forward to hearing uh, the examples and the experiences of our colleagues from Thailand and also Purba. So again, thank you very much to GTF and to Align uh, and I look forward to the, to the presentations and the discussion to follow. Thanks. Thank you, ma'am. I now take this uh, opportunity to invite our uh, first speaker, uh, Mr. Purba uh, Lendu, who brings over 25 years of conservation experience across several themes in Bhutan and beyond. And he continues to support tiger conservation efforts across tiger range countries as the coordinator of the Integrated Tiger Habitat Conservation Program which collaboratively involves multiple conservation partners and government agencies and bringing everybody together for uh, tiger conservation through this important initiative. And uh, both WWF and GTF are important partners of uh, ITHCP and have worked collaboratively since uh, long. So I welcome my friend and valued colleague, Purbaji. Good morning, everyone. Good afternoon. And thank you so much, uh, Radhima ji and also uh, Mohini ji for this opportunity. And also, I'd like to thank uh, the Global Tiger Forum on behalf of IUCN for giving us this opportunity to present this case about ITHCP, some of the lessons learned. So in uh, in a way, uh, we uh, this my presentation does not directly talks about uh, you know the support to smart uh, green infrastructure but i've been asked to share some of the experience of ITHCP in terms of uh, uh, collaborative actions and also uh, the you know the funding that we are doing at the moment and also some of the lessons learned so in so my presentation will be talking about the background of ITHCP. I'll just briefly talk about ITHCP. Some of you might already know about this one and also briefly touched upon what are our experience in terms of building collaborative partnership and also on the long term funding commitment. So some of you already might know about this one. So the Integrated Tiger Habitat Conservation Program is the IUCN's Tiger Conservation Program and it was created back in 2014 as a contribution to the Global Tiger Recovery Program and at the same time to contribute to the uh, biodiversity, Global Biodiversity Framework. And it's been funded by German corporation, uh, commonly known as PMC, YPFW Development Funding, uh, with a total amount of 47.5 million euro and it cost until 2027. And this is a science-based conservation action supporting frontline uh, conservation actions on the ground and it has a multidimensional approach, uh, which consists of species, habitat, and people. So I'm not going to go into details what we do in each of the specifics, because I think uh, pretty much I'm quite certain that most of the uh, audience are very uh, well versed with these uh, three specifics. So uh, Madam Sajal was just talking about this one before that, you know, the tiger number really came down in 20. 2010 and world got together here just to you know uh, 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 take this curve up so you know that ITCP was actually started around that time so it was one of the critical sort of funding with many other uh, conservation partners you know to increase this target number and then just to give a brief overview of the portfolio. So this is actually where we work. And since from 2014, ITHCP has been working in phase manner. For example, the phase one, uh, ITHCP has funded about 17 projects uh, amounting to 17.78 million euros. And these are the dots, blue dots you can see are the distribution of our projects. And the phase one has already been completed and it has also been evaluated where I will be sharing some of the results today. And then the phase two, uh, nine projects funded amounting to 4.42 million euros. 
And then in phase three, five projects, 3.49 million. And currently we are in uh, phase four. Uh, this is tranche one. We have started two projects. Phase one, four is divided into tranche one and tranche two. And in tranche two, the recent one, we are in the process of preparing six more projects worth 10.7 million euro. And these are the distribution of our projects. And currently, as I said, phase one has already been completed, evaluated, whereas phase three to four, it all runs in parallel at the moment. And the total projects funded so far by ITHCP is uh, 40 projects, uh, amounted to 38.42 million. And then I just also want to stress that in ITHCP, uh, we follow this ESMS application very strictly. And this is the process how we follow. Once we receive the concept note, then we have the preliminary approval or screening. Then we have detailed ESMS screening. Then it, we go to project development where ESMP is prepared. And then we have monitoring and also evaluation. And then uh, I think the built-in collaborative partnerships on uh, in terms of ITHCP implementation is, I think, a very important aspect in this program. And we work with wide varieties of uh, key partners. These are our key partners, you can see here, uh, who implements our projects in the field. And in particular, I would like to uh, give an example of this consortium, uh, which works in central Sumatra. Um, this is a consortium called uh, Kirapat Con Consortium for Human Tiger Coexistence in Rimba Baling Wildlife Reserve in Central Sumatra in Indonesia. Uh, I was there quite recently to look at the project and I'm very much impressed with the result they had. So this project is implemented by a large consortium. For example, like this is a government, uh, provincial government. And then we have the national NGO called Yapika who takes uh, leads. And then these are being supported by, you know, various other uh, organizations like Intercom, the Ecotourism Network, the Sumatran Tiger Conservation Forum. This is, of course, ITHCB logo. And then this in turn are supported by, you know, the local uh, NGOs, sorry, uh, yeah, the local partners. So in a way, this is a very big consortium that has started since 2015 and has been still uh, going on there. And they have been really uh, doing very good work in terms of, uh, balancing this the uh, coexistence. And then now I would like to briefly touch upon some of the lessons learned. In many ways, I think um, these are kind of a generic one, and also this can apply to other projects as well. And also, I think we can also sort of try to preempt, you know, if you are going to start a new program, something like this, you can preempt as well as, but nevertheless, these are some of our lessons learned so, so far. Uh, from building collaborative partnership. The number one is importance of trust and communication. We have realized that, for example, like active listening, creating a space where all partners feel heard and valued is very important. And this is followed by a transparent communication, you know, sharing information openly and honestly to build trust among all the partners. And then, of course, uh, conflict resolution, developing effective mechanism for resolving disagreement and disputes. And most of this, we address this during our ESMS application at the pro project uh, preparation stage. And then the value of shared vision and goals. Uh, it's very important to have a very clear objectives being established as a shared vision for tiger conservation that you know aligns with the goals of all the partners. And then comes the collaborative planning, which should involve all partners in planning and implementation of conservation initiatives, regular evaluation, which is part of the standard ITHCP protocol, monitoring progress and making adjustment as need to ensure alignment with the shared goal. And then of course, the need for mutual respect and understanding, we learned that this is very important because you know there are like cultural sensitivity. So we need to require uh, sort of recognize and respect the cultural difference of each partners. And these are very important, especially if you work, uh, you know, uh, for example, if you work in a transboundary landscape, for example, like uh, we work on transboundary landscape in Tarayak, in Sundarban. So it is very important to recognize this cultural difference. And then inclusivity, uh, inclusivity is very important, ensuring that all partners feel valued and included in the decision-making process. 
And then, of course, empowerment, uh, especially empowering local communities, you know, take the stewardship of the project is uh, uh, very important as well. And then the another important thing is importance of long-term commitment, you know, uh, securing long-term funding for supporting ongoing conservation activities, then capacity building. Uh, we really need to invest in capacity building of partners to ensure the sustainability of the uh, collaborative effort. Monitoring and evaluation, evaluation, which I have talked, I think, regularly assessing effectiveness partnership and making necessary adjustment. And then, of course, the role of the effective leadership in each of the partners' organizations are also very important. For example, like providing clear direction and guidance to partnership, you know, creating a supportive environment where partners can contribute and collaborate effectively. And then of course there needs to be a uh, sort of an accountability, you know, holding partners accountable for their commitment and also for the contribution. And then now, of course, uh, there are uh, challenges. Also, we have uh, realized that uh, you know there are also quite a number of challenges when we work on when we take on these such a large collaborative uh, partners on board. Uh, for example, like divergent interests and priorities, because you know. Uh, if you talk about conservation versus development, then you know uh, balancing the need of target conservation with other economic development goals of local communities and government. Uh, this is one of the very important challenges that we face when we go to develop project or discuss or in a way implement project. Then short term versus long term goal, uh, aligning the short term priorities of different partners and with the long term goals of target conservation objectives, because many of our partners with limited amount of resources. And also with the capacity, they often do have short-term goals. So how do you align the long-term objectives of the target conservation? And then lack of trust and communication also plays a very important role. I think it's also one of the biggest challenges. Um, there are, you know, in some places, there are also historical conflicts, addressing past grievance or mistrust between different stakeholders. Then there's a language and cultural barriers overcoming communication challenges in diverse partnership. Here also I can bring up the examples of transboundary collaboration. And then there is also a power imbalance, you know, ensuring that we need to ensure that all partners have an equal voice and, you know, treat their happy, uh, they, are, they should be treated uh, equally. And of course the institutional barriers are there. There are like, you know, uh, bureaucratic red taps, navigating complex legal and administrative procedure, procedures. And these bureaucratic uh, procedures are there for reason. And then I can, we can all understand that, but we need to navigate this one. Um, I've been a bureaucrat myself, so I will know about that one. And then a lack of coordination, uh, coordinating efforts across multiple organization and also with the agency. Then there's, of course, a limited resources, you know, addressing resource constraint that can hinder collaboration. The other challenges is with regard to climate change, which we know now, uh, sorry, uh, environmental uncertainties, for example, like climate change, you know, adapting to changing environment conditions and their impact of tiger habitat. We know that tigers now are frequently now seen in the high altitudes of India, Nepal, and Bhutan. And also there are like emerging threats, you know, responding to new threats of tiger conservation, such as illegal wildlife trade or habitat fragmentation. And in terms of anti-poaching and illegal wildlife trade, why I say emerging threats is because in many cases, I think when we, you know, do our patrols or, you know, curbing illegal activities related to curbing illegal wildlife trade, we find ourselves at least uh, one step behind the poachers or those people who are involved there. So we actually basically learn from them. So threats are like different kinds of threats that emerging in this uh, in these cases. And there is a social and political factors there, a social unrest, you know, addressing political instability or social conflicts that affects conservation effort. And I can give an example of our projects in Myanmar at the moment. We have a project with the FFI and also with the Wild Asia. Although the project is small, we are quite uh, struggling, and then um, it, we, we have been quite certain that now we cannot move ahead, ahead in Myanmar with the new project. So these are some of the challenges we are at the moment. But also a problem with the land trainer issue, resolving this, uh, you know, we need to resolve disputes over land ownership and also use rights when we, you know, especially look at project sites. And then now uh, on the long-term funding commitment. Uh, so, IDHP funding uh, has, has 
been there for like 13 years now, it goes until 2027. 20, and it is a making initiative in the sense that, you know, we uh, ask for concept note, we review concept note, then we provide a project preparation budget to develop project, and then we review proposals. But in some cases, there has also been a cases where we try to provide funding for those projects that really does well in the field and those initiatives that needs upscaling. And also, to, to those areas where there is a critical gap. And it's being funded by KFW Development Bank, uh, which is in a way, it's uh, like a sort of a risk for us because we are just one donor, but then they have been so generous to take us until 2027. And then quite recently, uh, I think Dr. Sejal has mentioned this in the in a keynote that we have target conservation coalition. We have been doing some sustainable financing studies for different tiger landscape. So we are looking looking into like how we can sustainably fund all the tiger landscape in the years to come. Now, in terms of the long term long term funding commitment, uh, I would say that in terms of tiger conservation, this is fairly uh, sort of a long term commitment because it's uh, about fifteen years. And these are I think, some of the lessons learned that we can share with you. The first one is value of consistency and sustainability is very important. Uh, we need to avoid project interruptions because ITHCP recognizes the importance of consistent funding you know, to, prevent, to prevent disruption in conservation efforts. And scale and impact, long term funding has enabled ITHCB to implement, implement larger projects and achieve greater impact. Most of our projects are between 1 million and 2 million. And then the long term vision, uh, ITHCB's commitment to long term uh, funding has allowed us to focus on addressing a complex issue of target conservation. And then the power of strong, uh, of strong partnership, which is uh, very important that we want. The trust and reliability. Uh, it simply has a strong partnership with government, NGO, and local communities uh, through a consistent funding commitment and the collaboration. Uh, long term funding has facilitated a collaboration and coordination among the part. And then the risk uh, mitigation of ITHCP has found that the long term funding helps to mitigate the risk associated with short term funding and fluctuation. So, um, the third one is need for a strategic approach. So, in terms of addressing complex challenges, uh, we have learned that the need for a strategic approach to address the complex challenges for which is very important. And then the habitat restoration, you know, the long term funding has uh, enabled ITACP to uh, invest in various sorts of habitat restoration. Habitat management, etc., which I think by far is a very important thing. So, you know, especially when we talk about the human conflict, I think if we are able to manage the habitat, I think, you know, try to do one inside the forest, I think that is the first thing I think we're looking at the cost of human conflict management. And then the integration, integration effort, you know, we need to have self funding. Which uh, supports sustainable combat in the wildlife trade and poaching, which is a growing problem and is expanding, I think, probably. The importance of data decision making uh, is very important uh, in terms of monitoring and evaluation. Uh, we found that DHCP has used a lot of money to support its ongoing monitoring and evaluation of this conservation effort. Uh, in terms of adaptation, uh, we have been able to adapt our strategies. From data and obtaining some standards. And in terms of success measurement, uh, long term funding has enabled ITHCP to measure and hopefully the overall impact of its conservation initiatives. Then there is the benefit of task debugging, which is one very important aspect that we have learned. Uh, training and development, uh, ITHCP has invested in training and development of the staffs and also partners. And in the infrastructure, the funding has enabled ITHC to invest in infrastructure. We, as I said, we have invested in smart infrastructure or linear infrastructure, but we have invested in infrastructure in the protected areas, you know, such as rental schools, office facilities, or field equipment, uh, like that. And then the last one is innovation. You know, consistent funding has provided a development of a lot of new ideas in the field.
So with this, I would like to end the presentation here. And I would once again like to thank for the opportunity and I would be very happy to answer any questions that you might have. Thank you so much. Thank you, uh, Purbaji, for that insightful presentation and uh, the collaborative work of uh, the ITHCP. I uh, now invite uh, Mr. Sompat Duang Chantrasiri. Uh, and Sompat has been leading tiger and wildlife conservation work in the famous Western Forest Complex of Thailand. He is also the GTA focal point on the tiger agenda and has represented and has represented Thailand in several international fora. He currently heads the Khao Nang Ram Wildlife Research Station under the Department of National Parks, Wildlife and Plant Conservation, Thailand. And he over the years he has promulgated science-based conservation management and has authored several peer-reviewed research work and has overseen a lot of field projects on the ground. So I welcome my friend Sompat. Thank you, Monish. Uh, but I would like to thank the host for inviting me and my colleague to be a speaker for, for this webinar. Uh, my talk today, I would like to share with you about uh, what going on on the tiger conservation in Thailand for the last decades? You hear me? Dick, next. Uh, Thailand have a uh, 12, uh, since 2010, we have a national tiger action plan as a guideline for effective conservation for tiger and their habitat, especially in the priority landscape. And we are able to achieve the target to the, the implementation of the plan with the key implementation activities such as uh, strengthening the habitat protection with the smart patrol system and rigorous monitoring system and international collaboration with the, uh, our, uh, the NGO for Tiger conservation effort. Next please. So I would like to inform you about a uh, hiker habitat in, in Thailand. Thailand has become the one of large stronghold for the white tiger in Southeast Asia. Uh, they are exclusively in the polluted area which considering large forest landscape, over only 5% of Thailand total area, or just 25,000 square kilometer, as shown on the map. And we uh, classify the habitat of tiger in two categories. One is the first priority landscape, uh, which contain the tiger source population which are in the green block. Third one is uh, in the West, Western Forest Compact, or you can call WebCom, is a high tiger population. Yeah. And another priority landscape is Dong Hoya Yen Khao Yai Forest Compact in the eastern side of Thailand, is support of related uh, tiger density. And beside of priority land habitat, uh, we have potential landscape in the blue, in the blue block, uh, which have contained low tiger abundance or no dividend, but still have a pay in the area. Next is. And today I, I would like to highlight on the tiger conservation in, in, in the Western Forest Compact. Uh, is uh, approximately 800, 18,000 square kilometers is compiled, 17 protected area. And we have focused the conservation effort in the three protected area uh, composed at the core area of where from we call Tung Yai and Mue Kha Kang. After this, we, I will say 
H K K T Y something. Uh, it's contain highest number of tiger and in Webcom. And we have uh, about 100 of the park ranges for, for protect the wildlife and protect habitat in, in this area. Next, please. Uh, the key intervention, intervention for tiger recovery in the Webcom is strengthen the, the, the law enforcement system by using the smart patrol technique with the for wildlife and protected area management. The patrol program was initiated in 2006, start in HKK and train and follow up support the, the impact to the other protected model, the capacity building and training of the protected area team, both the management level and the operation level for the best practice. Next, please. Almost 15 years, SKKTY have annually patrol uh, spartial coverage have been continually increased and maintained at about 70% uh, of the area. And annual patrol frequency for highest more than 20 visits per kilometer in the high list area. And the subpatient of a uh, Coaching activity with success indicator, including that no, we have no tiger poaching incident encountering since 2013. And uh, the reduction in, in cutter rate of poacher camp per 1,000 like 1, kilometer patrol distance from uh, 15 to 2 to Camp since 2016. Next, please. And the smart the system, the smart control system had been uh, expanded to cover other protected area in Webcom, and right now more than 120 protected area across Thailand. Next, please. And at the core area, we have set up a monitoring system for by using camera tab and capture the capture sampling for tracking the tiger population 10 since 2004. And we, and we have survey annually. Yeah, next is. This is a result from the last season. We uh, have set up four twenty location in in HKK cover uh, about 60 percent of the of the protected area. So, about and we got uh, one hundred twenty three. Uh, adult tiger for, for for last season. Next please. Uh, okay. Uh, from since 2007, we have uh, set up. We got uh, 60. Uh, 40, sorry. 46 tiger was kept. What? Captured by photograph, uh, and right now is come increasing uh, to to two hundred uh, more than double the tiger in in this area, and the main uh, area for the tiger is in HAK. Next please. Uh, and next please. And we also uh, uh, study on the uh, pay density by using the light hand set and distance sampling. This graph show you the uh, the result from 2006 to and 2008, and we 
did it again in 2021. Uh, And one thing, uh, one chat. Next piece. And also the elephant. This is this photo show you the distribution of the elephant in 2008 and 2020. You can see the the, the elephant have distributed more in in the west, in the western side of, 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 of this area. Next please. To establish the standard diet, the monitoring system for the tiger population, uh, the government, I mean, uh, my department, uh, DNP, with partnership with uh, different agency has set up the camera tab to monitor the tiger population and their prey in the key habitat across the Western Forest Compact and Dong Phaya in Khao Yai Forest Compact. The habitat, uh, no, sorry. The camera tab survey have been undertaken annually more than 15,000 locations since uh, 2019. This is important for providing sufficient data and understand the status of this animal contribute to effective conservation and management for the tiger and their habitat. Next, please. So this is the, some data we found. Uh, the Western Forest Compact and SHK are the most valuable tiger salt population in, in Southeast Asia. We have captured many tiger originate from HAK, EY, and now have certain and breed in, in the north and the south of, of Webcom. And our monitoring at last year also give us the information that we can use or uh, further the conservation intervention and all of the the la we have data for last year we got about 150 adult tiger capture in in western forest compared plus the more than 70 cow next please Uh, based on the result of the camera tab survey uh, on the tiger state that in 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 Thailand, we survey in twenty three forested area in in twenty twenty four, and we estimate the uh, tiger population is about one eighty to two hundred twenty. And uh, what? 80, about 80% 80 is in the population, it's from Mokha Kang and Tung Yai. Okay, next is. And now we yeah, uh, have uh, developed the National Hacker Action Plan uh, is for the next. 12 years that have been approved to be uh, used as a guideline to effective uh, conservation of the tiger and their habitat under the high standard and monitoring system to the active participation for of the, all the stakeholders and the key activity include in the action plan in cover various dimension as she said here, and we focus on the, uh, the, to recover the tiger in the priority landscape and also the potential 
landscape and the player in the potential landscape. And next, please. This is the last slide. Uh, the National the Department of National Park, Wildlife and Plant Conservation as a primary agency responsible for the protected areas and wildlife have been supported by the variety national and international NGO and the private community for the tiger conservation effort in Thailand. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Sompaji. And uh, on behalf of all the partners, in fact, we have reiterated that before also, we congratulate Thailand on being the first Southeast Asian country to increase its wild tiger numbers from uh, the last uh, baseline. And it showcases the tremendous efforts that have been taken both at the uh, government level as well as those from the partners plus the larger citizen support and Thailand continues to be uh, the fulcrum in the entire region to get uh, all these actions uh, put together. I now invite our last speaker for the day and who's going to speak on a very unique uh, initiative that was taken on the wildlife corridor on highway 304 which is a much uh, uh, reward kind of uh, an, an initiative which joins uh, portions of protected areas in the second largest uh, uh, forest complex of Thailand. So I invite Mr. Sompan Pakpien, who heads the Dong Feiyan Khao Yai Wildlife Research Station, and he's overseeing tiger and wildlife recovery efforts in the second largest forest complex of Thailand. Having published several research papers on wildlife ecology and protected area management, Mr. Sompan continues to spearhead conservation efforts in this critical wildlife landscape and which also serves as a priority area for tiger recovery in Thailand. So I welcome you, uh, Mr. Sompan. Okay, th thank you, Monish. And uh, first thing I, I would like to, to thank you to invite, invite me to uh, join this webinar. So, uh, uh, next presentation, I, I would like to uh, talk about uh, a wildlife that uh, we found from uh, camera tap uh, around the uh, wildlife corridor on uh, Highway 304 in Thailand. Uh, the Dong Bayayan Khao Yai uh, forest complex is uh, comprised of five protected areas, including uh, Khao Yai National Park that that on the on the left side. Uh, next from Khao Yai is uh, Tabla National Park and and Pangsida National Park below the the. Uh, Tapland National Park and two protected area are uh, Tapia uh, National Park and Dong Yai Wildlife Sanctuary. Uh, uh, the total area are uh, about uh, 6,300 square kilometers and uh, this uh, forest compact uh, declared as a World Heritage Site in uh, 2005. Uh, for the, the Dong Mayen Khao Yai, uh, uh, Wildlife Research Station uh, was established in, in 2018 as the DNP agency, which is located in Tapla National Park. Uh, the aim of wildlife research station is uh, to study uh, the, the wildlife, uh, uh, the wildlife ecology and uh, monitor, monitoring, uh, monitoring the key species of, of the forest complex. This landscape also plays as a second stronghold of 
uh, tiger in Thailand. And this map, this map uh, show you the potential habitat for, uh, for a tiger. That data is from past, past occupancy survey. Uh, we found the tiger in four area except Khao Yai National Park. So uh, in Thailand, we we try to uh, recover the tiger uh, to Khao Yai National Park again. So we 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 build a a wildlife corridor to connect uh, Khao Yai and 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 Thap Lan National Park. Uh, the wildlife corridor official opened in uh, 2019, which is linked be between Khao Yai and Thap Lan uh, National Park. Uh, the project has been divided into uh, uh, three sub-projects. One is uh, overpass or a tunnel uh, that, that you see in the in the screen and to underpass or flyover uh, and an overpass is about uh, 400 meter long i mean i mean the 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 uh, tunnel that uh, and and two flyover is 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 uh it's eight meter above the cloud over the this ten about uh three hundred forty and five hundred seventy uh, meters. Uh, those uh are being built on part of highway three o four, which why anymore will be able to cross between uh, two protected area. Uh, so uh, the wildlife survey along the, the corridor, we will set up a total uh, uh, 20, 21 camera trapping in uh, 21 location uh, from November 2000. Uh, 23 until May uh, 2024 uh, between Thap Lan and Khao Yai National Park. Camera tap location as shown in the uh, in the map uh, as the red red dot. So uh, a total of uh, uh, 28 wildlife species were detected from a camera trap. Uh, of these, based on IUCN status, uh, one species is classified as a uh, critical endangered species, Ashwa pangolin, and uh, three species as endangered uh, elephant, doe, and uh, last spotted seaweed and nine species are uh, classified as vulnerable. Uh, each species were detected at the the underpass. Uh, the species list uh, as shown in the table. Uh, uh, elephant, uh, big, a uh, big uh, animal, uh, until a uh, pigtail macaque. Uh, I have some some video clip from uh, uh, Camilla Tap to show you uh, some just some some animal that they cross between Thap Lan and Khao Yai. So this, this clip shows that elephant, they, he crossed from 
ภาพลานจาก on the right ถูกเขาใหญ่ that on the left side so this is the same same elephant but uh, different different time they they cross from uh, เขาใหญ่ to ทับลาน again Uh, this species cover they uh, they cross from Thailand to Aoyai National Park. We also have some some wildlife. This this uh, muncak. Is uh, feeding uh, under the uh, oh, uh, underpass of wild uh, somebody here. Cows. It's a cows. Yeah, I would I would like to to go quick, and this is a uh, zero uh, that move across from from Thailand to Khao Yai National Park. Uh, twenty a uh, twenty uh, wildlife species that uh, will were detect uh, around the. Uh, Uh, overpass or tunnel. Uh, um, again, I have some uh, video clip from uh, from the the this this point. This clip uh, it show uh, somebody they are crossing the tunnel uh, that that uh, they cross from uh, top land to Khao uh, Yai. Top land is on the uh, right side and Khao Yai is on the left side. So you on on the on the. Uh, Top right of the of of this trip, you will see uh, traffic that they moving on the road. And uh, crowded lip part, we also found, found uh, on the uh, tunnel that they moving uh, between top land and Khao Yai, go and back, go and back. Uh, on the on the top of the tunnel, we uh, we also make a layer, a solid for for uh, wildlife. Uh, so sometimes we we found 
uh, uh, some animal that they feed on the solid on the top of the tunnel. The optity of the solid be that we made is uh, uh, for uh, for wildlife uh, to use the uh, a corridor and and cross between Khao Yai and, and Thap Lan. And <coughs> a 14 species were, were detected around the, the underpass. This, this, uh, this underpass that uh, next uh, from the, the tunnel. Uh, the species list, uh, as in the table, like uh, Asian new friend uh, until uh, a small, small animal, like a uh, red jungle fowl that we found uh, from this uh, wildlife corridor. Uh, so from uh, our uh, our, our data that uh, that we uh, use a camera tap for monitoring a wildlife around the wildlife corridor. So uh, 28 species were detected around the wildlife corridor. Uh, and we found elephants uh, crossing a boat, a uh, flyover or boat uh, underpass. But we never found elephant crossing the, the tunnel. And also we, we found a tiger track uh, around the, the uh, flyover or uh, uh, underpass. It's about five meters away from, from wildlife corridor that wildlife corridor, sorry, that we hope uh, tiger uh, they will will move from Tapland to to Khao Yai soon. We hope that, and we try to uh, control uh, uh, threat to, so I think it's one is one, one thing is important to, to uh, if we, we want, if we, we want to uh, take it, uh, this part from from top line to Khao Yai. So we have to 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 control this too. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr. Sompan. And uh, uh, so it's as I had mentioned earlier. And what you rightly pointed out, this wildlife uh, corridor 304 serves as an important role model in the entire region because it's, it's not only the science and the engineering behind it, but it's also the aesthetics. The So we, we have been trying to make a lot of linear infrastructure, but sometimes it leads to more gaps uh, on the adjacent sides, or sometimes it's not as per the requirement uh, in a in a given area but but as we can see the kind of movement that is happening in this particular uh, landscape and it's also a model where both the underpass and the uh, the the overpass have been used uh, together and with, with species like clouded leopard moving which is quite elusive otherwise uh, and with the the traffic flowing right below it it showcases that these uh, habitats can actually be uh, protected to so because we cannot protect all the linkages but at least some of the important linkages that you have been able to uh, showcase in this particular uh, presentation is, is commendable perhaps it's one of those uh, structures where we see the maximum species diversity moving in given the rich biodiversity of uh, of thailand and uh, the plethora of mammal species, as we saw, that that were using this particular uh, space. So I I think it's it's really a great uh, model to uh, to replicate and also to 
take it to other uh, tiger range countries and uh, almost all trcs are now working on on the green infrastructure mitigation and so we congratulate uh, thailand both on the tiger uh, number increase as well as such innovative uh, design and structural engineering that has taken place to protect this particular corridor i would also reach out to my colleagues in wwf that if we can uh, come out perhaps with a special chapter or a case study on this particular uh, wildlife corridor it would be very helpful in the overall gtrp uh, context perhaps we can uh, join hands with iuc and uh, the government and everybody together to come up with a good case study on this thank you Aridima. Thank you, Monish, and uh, very insightful uh, presentation from all our speakers. And we actually agree on that fact that we should come up with document it much better because there are a lot of learning opportunities available from this, uh, especially what Sombonji has uh, shown us. That is a model which has not been replicated much around in Southeast Asian countries also. So Zompanji, we will be uh, we will direct one question to you directly. Um, what what are the like making such tunnel, making such overpass requires engineering capacity also capacity. So is there you have engineers and technology available, which is uh, helping you in making it more ecologically sustainable? Uh, marvels like the underpass and the tunnel that you have shown us right now. So, uh, oh. so, Ampen, uh, so the, the, there's a question uh, from you that uh, what is the, so when we are undertaking such a project in Thailand, is there uh, inherent capacity uh, within the country what what are the departments uh, involved and what is the engineering capacity to to build this kind of a project or is it also a partnership between uh, different institutions so just wanted to know how the how these structures are thought of and uh, the engineering that goes behind it so open to you You are on mute. Uh, I'm, I'm not quite, uh, quite understand uh, the question from, from you that. Uh, so, Sompan, so, it's about, uh, so is it, so the, the engineers, the, the engineers on the ground or the, the civil engineers, the road construction, uh, uh, the, people who are involved with it are where are, are they trained well within the country or uh, this this particular project had more partners involved uh, the wildlife corridor 304 or was it a structural partner involved in this process some agency which had helped in the construction of this uh, the 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 construction is is made from a different department. Okay. So so uh, DNP just just uh, 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 survey uh, and and talk with them uh, which uh, which point it, it should be made made a uh, wildlife corridor or something like that. So for uh, about uh, engineering, I, 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 I cannot answer you. Yes. Thank you, Swampanji. Uh, I think we can take up one question from um, the question answer, which is uh, again talking about uh, the corridor management. So either you or Swampanji can um, talk about the the will the action plan be looking into the corridors also because you listed the action plan uh, for coming upcoming action plan will the corridors and connectivity will be a uh, part of the action plan or not yeah um, 
the view of the corridor is part of, of action plan, especially for this corridor, we, we would like to improve the habitat around that corridor for tiger and pay can cross this corridor because in the western side of this complex, we have we lost the tiger for for more than ten years. We hope that uh, tiger would like to come back. Will come back in 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 Khao Yai by uh, the population the, from the Tapra National Park. And this corridor, uh, as a first question to some uh, point, the the Department of Highway have an uh, engineer and decide a project for develop this highway and and they consult with uh, DNP for uh, for the EIA and also the the place that we choose for appropriate location for the, this part, under part and over part. Yeah. We, we have survey uh, before, uh, before develop this road, this, this corridor, uh, the team, the wildlife team had to go to survey around, along the road for, for, for the good spot for set, uh, for build the, the, the corridor. Thank you. Thank you, Sampaji. Uh, Furbaji, we will be having one question for you. You you did mention that the major lesson learned is sustainable financing, one of the major lesson learned. Uh, but it is often difficult if large landscape inclusive of various partners and also addressing the climate change impact, which, which may not have the same intensity across different parts of the different tiger range countries. Or So in, in such a scenario, how do you suggest we deal with such challenges if we are going to replicate the ITHCP model elsewhere also? Uh, thank you very much, Radhimaji, for your questions. Well, certainly I think uh, there needs to be some sort of a long-term funding that complements ITHCP. There's no doubt we need that because we know from the fact that when we do call for proposal, uh, our funding is limited that we can fund, you know, six to seven large projects, but then we end up getting like 30 to 40 applications. So that there is a strong interest from, you know, the conservation community or from the government for that matter to, you know, to apply for the funding. and I know that this is very critical uh, in terms of you know the supporting the tiger conservation efforts in different countries and then uh, just for your information within the tiger conservation coalition there is now uh, um, you know that we are developing a, some sort of a funding mechanism very similar to tiger Conser uh, ITHCP uh, it's i think it's called tiger conservation uh, facility funding something else and which i think hopeful that it will get materialized probably towards the next end of next year so we certainly need such kind of a uh, complement together each other because we see a uh, sheer amount of interest that is uh, with, with, uh, among the conservation landscapes. And in terms of you know the requirement for such uh, replication, I, I think that um, I partly mentioned about this one, but then of course the, the securing long-term funding is very important. I think we need to sort of explore a variety of funding op options, yeah, including government, actually. I think from to raise funds over the government, I think we should learn from India. You know, India has such a large amount of target conservation funding going from government to various target conservation reserves. So we need to learn from, I think, take lessons from India as well to, you know, sort of like, yeah, you know, influence the government to provide funding for tigers. And then a uh, private sector is one uh, another thing that we have not been very successful at the moment, uh, based on my understanding. But we need to beef up uh, our efforts on having this private sector and corporate uh, donation. And also, most importantly, I think if we try to replicate, we need to be considering developing a sustainable revenue stream from the tiger landscape itself, because uh, at the current. Uh, Currently, I think we are just supporting, you know, livelihood opportunities and ecotourism and on a small uh, scale. But we found out that during our recent sustainable financing study uh, uh, by the Tiger 
Conservation Coalition in the tiger landscape, we found that there are a lot of nature finance mechanisms that we can actually do a lot from the field. So I think the uh, our uh, sort of objective in the long term should be like the tiger finance should come within the landscape, you know. So that has to be, I think, something that we need to keep in mind. And also the other thing I would just reiterate, you know, things I've spoken before that building a strong collaborative partnership, which is very important to identify key stakeholders in the target region, including government agency, it can be local communities. And like I said before, like a private sector and corporates, uh, which we are not, I think, uh, successful, at least in ITHCB at the moment. And then you're building trust and having open communication and we need to develop a, a shared uh, vision for tiger conservation. And also one of the most important aspects I would like to stress is that focus on community engagement is very important because at the end of the day, no matter what we do, if we don't support, the, if you don't engage or empower the community that are living you know, with the tiger, for example, we can, uh, I'm quite sure everyone agree that, you know, uh, tig tigers are there in the places where there are more people. For example, take case of India. India has the largest population of tiger and you have the largest number of people. So we need to really empower local communities to participate in such conservation efforts, I think. And then, the, of course, the important thing would be to address the needs and concerns of those people and, uh, you know, build support for conservation and also support, you know, that development of various kind of, uh, this would mean that like, a sustainable livelihood or such as like a different nature financing mechanism. And then the strategy should be there. There should be a very focused strategy. And of course, this has to be supported by strong monitoring and evaluation process. So I'm not sure if I've answered your question, but uh, this is uh, what, what I would say at the moment for now. You have very well wrapped up the um, answer for Baji. And uh, I completely agree that we should look into other opportunities when it comes to uh, financing these tiger landscapes. Like USAID is also funding uh, disaster resilient infrastructure. Then there is energy sector where a lot of partnership and especially interdisciplinary partnership is now coming into picture. So it is. Uh, uh, sustainable financing should not be just looking into the tiger landscape, but also the other climate change impact that is happening on these landscapes also. So uh, I think uh, we have a few questions, but we are really running out of time. If, if uh, the platform allows me, we can post these questions to our speakers over the email and then address it with our documentation in the later stage. So I think we can wrap up now and thank you so much to all the speakers for their time and presentation. Um, I would also like to thank my team members, uh, Mr. Pramod Neopani, who is lead Align Project, as well as from Global Tiger Forum, Arun Kumar and um, I think Arun is right now with our with us for this webinar. Thank you so much for everyone for uh, a very insightful webinar. And uh, we will be coming up with another one in soon. So we will be sharing uh, the details uh, over the mail as well as on the WWF India. Uh, social media handles as well as GTF social media handles. Do keep posted. We will be keeping you posted about these uh, webinars, coming upcoming webinars. And thank you once again for your time and um, insights. Thank you, everyone.